Hi, my name is Darren Stevenson. You're probably watching my YouTube channel. You can find me on Facebook as the Darren Stevenson in San Francisco. I have a blog at wondercloud.wordpress.com and I also have a website called organelle.org. I'd like to talk to you today about a revolutionary technology that I've been working on for about six months now. Essentially, um, the goal of the technology is to give to ordinary people the ability to use electronic information in entirely new ways together, ways so radical that they will actually develop new forms of human intelligence and new roles for everyone who uses it. <clears throat> I'm calling the idea the knowledge amp um, because what it does is effectively it collectively magnifies the intelligence of human users who touch data on the internet. Um, presently, the way that we use the internet is pretty backwards. What happens is there's swarms of information. None of it is valued in terms of its accuracy or dependability. And um, a lot of it is copied. Uh, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but vast amounts of the information that we see on the internet are basically just copied. A lot of it's very poor quality. A lot of it is just false. There's an incredible amount of propaganda from false collectives, false forms of intelligence, and basically just outright lies. And we have no way to kind of tell the difference between any of this stuff um, or to interact with it very intelligently. What we do currently is when we interact on the internet, that builds new forms of intelligence for corporations like Facebook, Twitter, Google, and YouTube. What I want to do is turn that around so that when we interact um, with each other and with data on the internet, it builds new forms of intelligence for us, not for them. Um, and then if they want some of that intelligence, they can rent or purchase it from us instead of fleecing us of the intelligence we generate by our activity and then selling us back tiny little pieces of that that make them lots of profit and don't make us more intelligent. Let me explain the difference between what I'm thinking about and what we're doing presently. So we're about 20 years into the birth of the internet and in internet time, which is accelerated, um, that, that's more like about 300 years. The really weird thing about that is that 20 years in, we are using a flat browser to access the internet in a way that is essentially like a dictionary, except it's worse because the search engines organize the results based on popularity. Now, anyone who understands intelligence and rhetoric realizes that popularity is no kind of measure of the value of data, and in fact, it can be grossly misleading. Additionally, when corporations um, are the people who tell us which data is important and which isn't, what we end up with is an incredibly skewed base from which to to get data and to look for results. I want to change all that in the most radical and shocking way that I think you're going to find very exciting. So here's what we're going to do instead. First of all, we're going to change the browser so that it works more like our minds. Our minds do not work like a dictionary. When you want to think or dream or create, you don't get an idea in your head, do a search, and then get a flat series of results in a list. When you do that, because, our, because the internet is a, is a metaphor for our minds, when we do it this way, we're actually damaging our intelligence. We're, we're retraining it to work in a way that's nothing like nature, nothing like our minds, nothing like memory or our intellects. And by the way, it's very important here to understand that memory is nothing like storage. If it were, we wouldn't dream. And the interesting thing about our dreaming is that if we don't dream, we don't learn. Not only, not only do we not learn if we don't dream, we die. Our bodies stop being able to regulate their homeostatic metabolism, and we will just perish of this. So the, the internet has been retraining us in very cruel and kind of crippling ways to depend upon mechanical algorithms, mechanical processes, and mechanical functions that actually not just limit our intelligence, they attack it and replace it, remake it in, the fo in forms that have nothing to do with what our actual capacities are. How would we turn this around? Well, the way that we can do that is really exciting. Let me explain a little bit. 
Firstly, we're going to build an entirely new kind of browser. Actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. Before I get to the browser, I want to talk about a very specific and interesting feature of our current electronic situation. That feature is surveillance. Most of us realize that Facebook, Google, and then intelligence agencies like the NSA and those of other governments are surveilling us constantly. Um, and their purposes in surveilling us is not, are not to make us more intelligent or to give us new assets that we can really um, use beneficially. Mostly they are to give them new kinds of intelligence, new assets that they can use to figure out how to sell us stuff. Or, in the case of the government, how to pre-prosecute us which is a terrifying idea. Let me talk a little bit about the power of surveillance. It sounds like a really scary word, and nobody really wants to be recorded. Right now what's going on is that everything we do on the internet, from our emails, and our private conversations, our, our video calls, all of the activity that we do, our searches, and what we choose and like and share, all that's being recorded and abstracted into ways to link us into networks that tell people how to sell us things better, what we're interested in, and also how to manipulate us really easily. We need to reverse that trend. Now here's the exciting part of this idea. Although the idea of surveillance sounds frightening, and it is, because frankly, we can't survive recording all of what humans do. That creates huge waves of data that have to be recorded, backed up, analyzed, and etc. That's just not going to work. We have to compete against that data. In other words, the United States government will preserve the data that the NSA has on you before they will preserve you, your family, or your life. You will have to pay to get health care, but they pay to preserve your data, including that health care data. See how dangerous that is? What that means is that we're actually being converted to resources, to data objects, and we have to compete against those for survival, and we will lose. We're already losing, even now. So I'm not talking about the future, I'm talking about right now. We've got to reverse this trend. And one of the ways that we can do that is by understanding how surveillance works better. If anyone's ever seen a child in their room, especially a child who is struggling to learn language, what you're going to notice is some astonishing phenomenon. The children set up essentially a, a surveillance environment. Now, of course, the, the home is a surveillance environment. The parents surveil the children. The children are aware of this surveillance. The parents, the mode of surveillance of the parents is loving, encouraging, it's um, learning oriented, and it's protective. So what we have there is a surveillance environment where there are a lot of positive inputs and the surveillance produces actually minds. Our minds are born in a sort of uh, relational milieu where above us there are these kinds of godlike beings, the parents and um, our families. Um, around us there are friends and peers, children of our own age. But we also have the, often these um, very strange aspects called imaginary friends. What's interesting about this is that minds have a lot to do with surveillance. When you do something, you think about, well, what will my friends think of this? Or what would my culture think of this? That's a kind of self-imposed simulated surveillance. So much of our intelligence actually has to do with astonishing forms of surveillance that we don't get to experience ordinarily in our relationships with, uh, with electronic technology, but we should. And of course, we do get a little bit because our friends see like what we post and we think about like, what will my friends think if I post this? Stuff like that. That's again a kind of simulated self-surveillance. So what I want to get out here is that surveillance is an asset that we can use to build new forms of intelligence, new minds, new ways of relating with each other, with problems that we face as human persons and cultures, um, with some of the problems that our species faces in terms of dealing with our relationships with technology and nature. Surveillance is an astonishingly powerful asset and it's been completely misused against us. Now what happens when you establish a bunch of false authorities like the NSA, Google, and Facebook is that that actually affects the structure and development of our minds, our relationships, and our intelligence. What that means is that we will get damaged minds, especially when we know that there are, that there are surveillance authorities that want to prosecute us watching our every move, that actually will produce a kind of a schizophrenic 
situation, a very dangerous situation in which we begin to form minds in the likenesses of our expectations of prosecution, our expectations of being constantly observed. We can't be human in that milieu. We've got to do something different than that. So there's another form of surveillance that you're probably very familiar with, and that is the kind that happens in little tightly knit teams that have a very um, important goal that they all care a lot about, or maybe even practice uh, producing. One simple example of that is a sports team. A sports team is an intimately linked together uh, pod-like intelligence where all the members are constantly in, in, in incredibly close surveillance and attention and mutual super function. In other words, they go beyond the normal function available to ordinary people into a domain of incredible ability and almost divine seeming um, powers of perception, action, and accomplishment. What I want to do is give us that same kind of ability, that same species of ability, but with and for each other to build new forms of intelligence and to solve actual problems in the world instead of get scores on scoreboards and win money. We can do this very easily, actually. So the idea that I have will, first of all, give us a new way of browsing. And secondly, it will build some assets that belong to us, both personally and communally, not to corporations. These assets will be assembled by and for us for purposes that we believe in, that are authentic to our humanity, that help to protect each other from various kinds of false collectives, false authorities, people who want us to believe things that aren't true, who want to convert us to resources that they can use for um, ensuring their dominance, their reproduction, things like well, Monsanto, Google, Facebook. These are false collectives that do not exist in our interests. They exist in the interest of generating profits for shareholders. They're fictions. When they convert us to resources, we become fictional people. When corporations assault the environment and wipe out the, history, the historical um, sort of assets of life on Earth, our own minds and futures are destroyed and our humanity is stained because we know intrinsically the value of nature. And when we see it wiped out and turned into abstractions in bank accounts, what's going on is we're being wiped out, the future is being destroyed, and it's all for the, f for the purpose of a, a big network of lies, essentially. We can reverse that, and here's how we can do it. Firstly, we're going to build a browser unlike anything anyone's ever seen. What it's going to do is it's going to learn how we learn. And it's going to do that for each one of us, but also communally in an extensible array of networked relationships. So firstly, you'll have your personal um, aspect. This is, these are the things that only uh, you know and that are only known about you by you. And then outside of that, you'll have stuff that you're allowed, that you will allow friends and family, very close people to know. And then outside of that, um, a more closely knit social network, and then outside of that, the community as a whole. So it'll have each of these kinds of scales of privacy built in to the intelligence unit that drives this process. The browser itself, I'll come back to that in a minute and explain it more carefully. We're going to have to compete a little bit with uh, some traffic because it's early morning here. The browser itself is going to work completely different from what we're currently using. The way that our minds work is nothing like how we think. They work very creatively so that when we have an idea, it gets connotated, it gets surrounded by all kinds of connotations, memories, feelings, um, pieces of dreams, art we have encountered, stories we have encountered, myths, uh, religious ideas, belief systems. When we have an idea, it's a radical network of things. It's not a word that links to a list. It was never like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a browser that works a little more like our minds. And here's how it will look. On one side, you'll have a spinnable wheel that will have image-based data that is related to whatever you've typed into your search box. On the other side, you'll have a spinnable wheel that will have text-based data that will similarly, similarly relate to things in the, ter in the text box. Underneath that, you'll have data that both um, enhances and opposes 
and also connects both of those kinds of data into a, a small constellation like object that sits underneath your search box that you can modulate so that you can bring certain features into prominence or reduce them into the background and you can also travel into it by picking one of those or a set of them and replacing this with the current search term with that. That will give us the ability to travel into ideas and to explore in astonishing ways that are more like metaphors. Metaphors are actually the sort of closer to the basis of human intelligence than definitions. What we're currently using are systems that are based on definitions. That doesn't work. It does allow us to use the internet like a dictionary. It doesn't allow us to, inter to relate with information the way our minds do. So what we're going to do is we're going to build this browser that gives us this incredible way to sort of creatively spin, reconnect, reconnotate, and constellate all kinds of information that's related to and even opposing whatever we type in. We'll still be able to get flat results if we want, but we're going to have a knowledge adventure every time we interact with any kind of information. Above the search bar, we'll have some linguistic analysis of what we've typed in uh, on the left side maybe. And excitingly on the right side, every time we type in words, we'll see the etymological history, how these, lang how these words were made, what they come from, what meanings in original languages were, and we'll be able to determine which languages we see the etymology for. What that means is that every time we use language, we will begin to learn about language like a linguist or a forensic expert, but we won't have to study it. It'll happen just by interacting with our browser. Meanwhile, we'll learn how to produce metaphor-like relationships with knowledge instead of definition-like. I mean, the difference between a definition and a metaphor is shocking. A definition is really just like a flat thing you get out of a dictionary. A metaphor is a growing constellation of related ideas, images, possibilities, conflicting ideas, concepts, historical data, um, speculative data about the future. When we can begin to interact with the internet in a metaphoric framework, our intelligence is going to radically change and it will enhance, nourish, and grow our intelligence instead of limiting and inhibiting it. So the first part of the Knowledge Amp is the new browser paradigm. And I can show you some models of that later. But what's really important is underneath that. Underneath that, we have some assets that are incredible, that are nothing like we possess now. The first one of them is a personal intelligence amplifier. Essentially what it does is it learns everything you do. It learns your interests, it watches what you type, it knows your own typing style, it knows your vocal style. It will learn and observe you forensically, but not for the purposes of helping authorities prosecute you, for the purposes of helping you to enhance your own intelligence. In other words, what it learns about you will feed into the browser and help you fill those connotative aspects that surround your search terms. And it will do that ever more intelligently each time you use it. Now that's pretty exciting by itself, but there's something even more exciting, which is that as this asset grows, it becomes incredibly valuable. And again, it'll have a personal, um, what is the right word here? A personal uh, element. Um, a closely knit element for people who are close to you and your family and friends, very close friends, and then um, a close social network element, and then a communal element. All of these will inform and teach each other, and the social network and communal elements will be shared, right, so that they can, we will actually learn from other people learning. Each one of these will give us a personal intelligence assistant that is unique to our own minds, also our own families and friends, but it will also help us build extended kinds of intelligence that are wide-ranging, rapidly um, self-correcting and reinforming, and shared amongst everyone who uses the internet. Currently we have nothing like that. The power of this one little personal, personal intelligence uh, storage device and development device is unthinkable. What will, what will happen over a few years is that this will become so valuable that basically corporations will rent time touching just the, the aspects that you'll allow them to see in order to build their own versions 
of lesser intelligence that they can use for the purposes they use. Meanwhile, this will serve only the purposes that interest us and will give us powers of sensing, um, uh, understanding, and e analyzing information that no one, no ordinary person normally has. In other words, we will get forensic intelligence. We'll be able to examine our own text and learn all kinds of things about how we write, how we could write differently. Uh, we'll be able to examine our own communications and learn all kinds of things about that. And we'll develop new ways of learning by linking these little intelligence artifacts together. They are built from surveillance and they surveil us for purposes that agree with our own goals, creativity, education, protection, democracy, and intelligence instead of feeding corporations who build comparatively incredibly crude analogs of this that are used primarily just to sell us stuff. So the personal intelligence asset will be built by watching what we do with data when we write emails, when we type, when we speak, when we watch videos, when we do searches. It will, it will learn and know about our own minds and it will also assistively help us to expand our own capacities every time we do anything. So that's one of the underlying elements. Another one is we will do our own social networking. No one else will control that. We will get all of the data that, ha that is available from our social interactions and the networks that we form instead of corporations getting it. We will be able to benefit from that data and use it in ways that benefit us, our intelligence, and our, our ability to reach out and form communities that are powerful and that can change the world that can actually address the problems that many of the problems and challenges that we face. The third aspect is really amazing. It's what I call the vetting sentinel. What this will do is allow us to radically, forensically analyze any piece of data on the internet, a political speech, a video, an image, any kind of writing, um, any kind of meme, and we will be able to learn all kinds of amazing things about those objects that will help us determine whether they are trustworthy, whether they were copied, what their purposes were, what their sources were, not just presently, but in history. And, and it will also allow us to build a system where we value information that is intelligent and truthful and information that is copied and mimicked or that is basically propaganda and lies will get devalued. We will be able to look at written information or even speeches and immediately determine that someone is lying, that they're using a fallacy to convince us, that they're manipulating our emotions, or that they've invented some idea and are claiming that it is science or religion or truth when actually it's just something they made up. In other words, the vetting sentinel will act as a way to filter the internet at first but then to actually reforge it so that what we get are more and more kinds of really valuable, truthful, and trustful information, trustworthy information, and less kinds of information that mimic that, that manipulate us, that are propaganda. We're going to out the mimics. In other words, we're going to easily be able to see when people are lying, when they've copied something, when there's um, false content involved if it was photoshopped or changed from an actual photograph. We're going to get all kinds of forensic data just like the CIA would get or an intelligence organization, but we'll be able to use it for our own purposes to increase our own. And we will learn these methods as we play with them so that we're going to become like detectives, except we're not going to have to practice. It's going to happen just when we use the internet. So the vetting sentinel is crucially important. It's going to give us the ability to act intelligently with data and to tell when we're being manipulated. It's gonna give us the ability to sort of score trusted authorities, to build trusted authority networks for information, images, um, and all of the kinds of electronic uh, data that we currently interact with. One of the, the, the sort of the, the final piece on the side that link, all these, all these link together by the way, the final piece is that we're going to be able to form teams and we're going to have heroic identities because as we use the, the internet and we're going to build these assets together with our own interactions, as we use the internet we're going to be able to have a role 
That's a different thing from a job or a function. A role is a thing like a superhero or a sports team hero or a, um, a famous researcher. Each time we interact with the internet, we will each get credit in our social networks and our public networks for all of the um, information that we create, for the new forms of intelligence that we create. And so we're going to be able to form amazing little teams that can work together immediately to solve problems that have been completely untouched and insolvable in our current method of doing things. We're going to get heroic roles, and we're going to be able to have identities that aren't just a name tied to a social security number that you get taxed for. We're going to have identities that become heroic teachers, leaders, um, problem solvers, and uh, members of teams that actually radically transform human cultures, um, that solve problems that have been insoluble for basically since the beginning of time. And we're going to be able to do this so fluidly and so rapidly that it's going to shock people to see how quickly we can actually resolve problems when we're able to organize, unify, and magnify our intelligence using assets like these. Something like this can be built in six months. We can be using the internet in such a shocking way that it's going to be as if we're having a knowledge adventure together that's noble, heroic, and solves problems every time we use the internet. The vetting sentinel itself, the part of the um, structure that helps us to forensically analyze data, we're going to build the assets that will allow us to create that. And so various kinds of experts will help us to examine media so that we can see visual data that gives us clues about whether people are telling the truth, whether they're not, whether they're nervous, whether they're anxious, what their purposes probably are. Textual data that tells us whether these statements are trustworthy, whether they're based on fallacies, if they're copied from some other source, if they're not original, if they are original and are intelligent. We're going to be able to recreate the internet because what will happen is a value system will emerge where data that's really intelligent and users that are, that are creating powerful content and really contributing will get um, promoted, right? And all of the people who, and, and corporations and false collectives that are mimicking stuff, making stuff up and pretending it's science using scares and outrage to sell journalism and things like this, those are going to disappear. But not only that, once we start being able to interact with this in this way together, we're going to be able to change our cultures overnight. Our governments won't survive this, okay? There's no way we're going to be able to ever be crushed down and converted by false authorities to slaves, prisoners, spectators, and consumers. Now, this is a brief taste of the powers of the Knowledge Amp. What it's for is essentially it's an intelligence synthesizer. We're going to make the music of human intelligence together in a way we've never been able to do in any context we've ever experienced. And we're going to be able to do it naturally, mostly just by talking to each other and watching and learning and reading the things we want to learn. We're not going to have to have a, an extra job or anything. This is just going to help us do this naturally by taking advantage of all of the thousands of minds and all of the activity that we produce every day, organizing that activity into new forms of intelligence that we can share, that we can locally possess, control, modulate, play with, pioneer, explore, and create. When we get to play with this, you're going to see that our minds are nothing like what we've been shown. We have the capacity to dream together in data in ways that will produce entirely new forms of learning and intelligence. And every child, every ordinary person, every grandmother or grandfather will have immediate access to these features. And these, and these experiences are going to change what it means to have a mind. They're going to change what it means to be a culture. They're going to give us the ability to immediately isolate and solve problems that have remained completely untouchable in our current systems. I hope that you're as excited as I am about this. I'm working as hard as I can to get the original models down so that we can, so that we can begin building it. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of what I think is in store for us. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to learning together and to changing the nature of, hum of human intelligence, human social relation, and our ability to use the internet. We're going to rebuild the internet in the image of the possibility of human superfunction 
not the image of a dictionary. Thanks for joining.